my wife needs prayer. She's been in a lot of pain in the last couple of days. Actually, all of but especially the last couple of days, she's already been Okay. Anyone else? Prayer requests? Testimonies? Yes. I would like some prayer. I have been horrendously dizzy the last couple of days. Okay. I would like some prayer for that. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, so why don't we have you two ladies come on up. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else have any prayer requests, any testimonies? Let's just invite the Lord in for the service tonight. Heavenly Father, we gather together in your name. The name above all names, Lord. The name of Jesus. We gather together, Lord, because we're hungry. We're hungry for your word, Lord. We're hungry for your presence, Lord. We're hungry for fellowship with one another, Lord. We're hungry to be more like you, Lord. And we're thirsty, Lord. We're thirsty because this world is dry. And it's so and it just it sucks it out of us sometimes, Lord. And we come to soak in your presence. To be renewed and to be restored and to pour out all that's left. And ask you to pour it in again, Lord, as you always do every day. You pour it over us, Lord. You pour it over us more. And every day you reveal more of yourself to us, Lord. And that's why we come, Lord, because we're hungry, Lord, and we're thirsty. And when we come, we know that we will be fed. We know that you have given us the water, that we will never thirst again, the living water. Right. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it is finished, Lord. Thank you, Lord that we can gather together and celebrate all that you have done. And in this special season, Lord, when we think about your humble entry into this world, Lord, when you humbled yourself and became man, took on flesh and dwelt among us, that you might know us and be like us so that we could know you and be like you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be with us tonight, Lord. Reveal yourself through the worship, through the word that's spoken tonight, Lord, through the fellowship with one another. Reveal yourself tonight and let us be forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone, to please turn it on silent until after the service. And Winter Jam, uh, January 26th. Mm-hmm. That's the show we're going to do Huh? The Utes. The Utes. Yeah, depending on uh, the situation with one of our Utes, she may be on three months grounded. <laughs> <laughs> See how it goes. Restoration, Lord. See, yeah, see, uh, and the rest of the youth, we've got to go and stuff like that. It'll work out. So. Yeah. Young heart. Young heart. Yeah, as I say, anybody who wants to go, it's not just for the youth, but hopefully the youth will join us. Yeah. Amen. 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 It's always a good time. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Ron, do you want to come take an offering tonight? Hallelujah. Please and thank you.
no, I didn't. You were, you do. I had to figure out what it was going to be. Why you wait between colleges and drugs? And you were like, okay, you should actually show up on an antidote. Well, yeah. If the second bus shows up, shows
Lord. We just rest, God, in your love, Lord. For we know, Lord, that you are always for us. You are never against us, Lord. We just thank you, God, that you sent your Son to die for us so that we may live life in that more abundantly. Thank you, God, for your truth, your word. I just pray, God, that the words that are spoken here tonight, Lord, will penetrate, Lord. They are your words, Lord, and they are life. I'm just so thankful, God, that you've called us all for this time. For such a time as this, you've called us. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Because you are always good. Always good. And I am grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. Yes. Such a beautiful presence of the Lord. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. James. (laughs) Um, God's word, it never ceases to amaze me that it's always on time. (laughs) When Suzanne was prophesying um, while we were praying for the two ladies, it just spoke to my spirit because it's what God wants us to hear tonight. So, so I wanted to share this with you. Um, I pulled this out of a file. I've had it since 2011, so almost seven years ago. And I remember it was right around springtime, and I was sitting out on my deck, and a deer just came up on our land. And here's what I heard the Spirit say to me. And I want you to close your eyes, if you will, and really listen to these words. He said this. He said, you see that deer out there? It doesn't question the Creator. It gets up every day and it eats. It trusts that I will provide all things for it to survive. The grain, the berries, the grass. It doesn't worry, is there going to be enough? It just knows there is. You were put on earth for one plan and purpose. Not to look around and see what the world sees. You were put on earth to keep your eyes focused on me and believe. I will provide all things to you. Don't worry about how it's going to work. Just believe that it does work. Abide in me and I in you. And I will provide all things for you. I am your creator. You are my creation. Walk in the understanding of the creator, not the creation. Be spirit led. For the truth, for the spirit is the truth. For the things of the earth will pass away, but the spirit remains forever. Feed your spirit. So I felt led to share that. For one, because I believe someone in this room needed to hear it. And two, because it goes along with what I'm going to share tonight which is resting in the Savior's love. So you're going to hear me say some familiar things um, when I talk about my message. We've been hearing it over and over again. But, I, but until I, we really get it and grasp it, I feel like God is going to continue to reveal this message to us. So He loves us so much and He wants us to get this and grasp it that, he, that we will keep hearing it until we do. Faith comes by hearing, we know, and hearing the Word of God. So um, I'm going to have a bunch of scripture here leading up, Mike. So um, in a few days, we all know, we recognize, and we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah, whom the Bible says began his ministry in 740 B.C., prophesied the coming of the Lord in this way. So Isaiah 714. It says this, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I just think about that. 740 BC, God gave Isaiah an, an insight of the coming of his son. The psalmist David was also given an insight of this greatness, which he expressed in Psalms 32, 1 through 2. It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So David also knew that there would come a day when a Savior would come and save the world. So now we fast forward... And we read in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the actual birth and the coming of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 1, 20 through 23. Matthew 1, 20 through 23 says, But while he, Joseph, thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So that is Isaiah 7:14 prophecy fulfilled. In Mark 1, 7-8, John the Baptist describes it as this. John the Baptist says, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So now let's jump to John 1, 1 through 5, and these are familiar scriptures that tell us this. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then jump down to John 1.14. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. So now let's go back to Luke 1, 30 through 33. Luke 1, 30 through 33. Describes the birth as this. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 2, 10 through 11. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So our Savior, the one who saved us from danger, the one who conquered sin and placed us in right standing with him. Matthew 1.21 said it. He shall save his people from their sins. Thou shalt call his name Jesus and he shall save his people from their sins. So right there, we should just hang it up and live by that truth. For after all, it was an angel from the Lord speaking to Joseph. What a simple truth that man has twisted for so long. 
God didn't send the angel to tell Joseph about law. The angel was sent by God to, re to reveal to Joseph grace. At that moment, before grace was even birthed, the angel was giving a message to Joseph, whether he understood it or not. It was revealed to him grace. If we pick it apart, we can see that law is deserved favor, meaning when you obey the commandments perfectly, you will be blessed. Grace is undeserved favor, meaning Jesus obeyed God perfectly, and you will be blessed by believing him. So think about that for a minute. Just by believing in him, our Savior, we have all things. God says that he will not withhold anything from us. So in that, we should rejoice, for Christ perfectly obeyed God and conquered sin. And therefore, in Romans 6, 14, it declares this. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You and I are not under law, which is deserved favor. Instead, we are under grace, which is undeserved favor. Everything we do in this life should be based around Jesus and the price that he paid on the cross. When we teach our children, our families, our friends of the Lord and his goodness, Jesus should be the center. When we sing songs of praise and worship, Jesus should be the center. He's not just the reason for the season. He is the reason we live, we move, and have our being in this earth. He's the reason we can pray, lay hands on people, and see good results. Experiencing the wonderful and marvelous things that only He can give. He is the reason for everyday living. We have to get into a Christ mindset. Everything should point to the cross. The finished and accomplished work. So did you hear what I just said? The finished and accomplished work. The finished meaning completed or ended. And accomplished, meaning highly trained or skilled work. Work, meaning mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. So Christ achieved and completed the effort so you and I no longer have to. The work is finished. Stop thinking about how you're going to get your healing. How, you're going, how your finances will line up. Or how your weaknesses in the flesh this displays a type of work that we are unconsciously doing. Instead, point those circumstances to the cross. Every time you feel like you failed, or you have doubt, or you have fear, point your mental thoughts to the cross. For instance, you get a bad doctor's report on your heart, say. We know the enemy will use that bad report against us. He'll point you to yourself and say, can you feel the pain? You feel your heart racing, skipping a beat? That's the time when you immediately point the liar to the cross and say, no, no. Look at Jesus. As his heart is, so is my heart in this world. And this works for everything the liar tries to use against us. Don't let the enemy point you to you and point to the law mindset. You know, it was funny. I was thinking about this the other day. It's like... Really, if we are thinking from a law mindset, humanity should feel guilty every day for just being in the flesh. Let me explain that. It's here is the mindset. When we feel like things are going good, we're doing things right, we don't think about guilt or shame or anything else because we just think we are okay because we're not out doing the big stuff, you know, like Christians try to measure the big stuff. The Bible says just being in the flesh is filthy rags compared to God and His glory. I'm not trying to put a damper on things, but that's what the Word says. The flesh is filthy rags. So really, even at our best, we still have the flesh and we are in need of grace. So we need to constantly remind ourselves that our mindset should not be based around our flesh, instead our spirit man. And I know we can all say yes and amen, but... How often are we thinking on that spirit man? Is it 24-7 or is it just when, you know, a need is needed? Are we clued into the reality of who we truly are, which is spirit, which is who God relates to, which is righteous? I heard Nathan um, talk a couple Sundays ago briefly on 
how God asked Adam, who told you you were naked, he said. And that has stuck with me. So today, I think when we feel guilty or shame or the feeling of not measuring up tries to enter in our minds, we need to ask ourselves, who's telling me I'm not righteous? Who's telling me I'm not measuring up? It's all in a matter of asking ourselves, whose voice are we listening to? We need to point every accusation to the cross. We need to stop working things over in our minds. We need to just rest and sit down in his presence, believing on the one who finished the work. So back when Adam and Eve were deceived in the garden, God told them in Genesis 3.19, He said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the, gar to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In Genesis 3.23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So both scriptures point to a picture of work when, after Adam fell. The first scripture said, the sweat of his face. The second scripture said, to till the ground. So a type of work. But the Word of God declares this about the finished work of Jesus on the cross in Hebrews 10, 12 through 14. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So Christ's finished work on the cross was offered as one sacrifice forever. And when you received him into your life, at that very moment you were forever perfected. So notice in uh, Hebrews 10:12 that after Jesus offered his life as a sacrifice and payment for all of our sins, he sat down. He sat down at the Father's right hand. Jesus sat down to demonstrate to us that the work is indeed finished. In the Old Covenant, um, it says that every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. It tells us this in 10, Hebrews 10.11. It says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So every priest stood when offering the animal sacrifice that really could never take away sin. They stood because the work of the priest was never finished. Under the old covenant of law, man works for God. That's why the law states very clearly, You shall not, you shall not, you shall, you shall. And you can read that at 20, Exodus 23, 17. Um, I won't read through them all, but just as an example of what I'm talking about. Exodus 23 through 17. <laughs> 23 through 17? Sorry. Exodus 23 through 17. <laughs> There's a bunch of shalt nots and shalt nots and you shall. So you shall not have other gods. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And it goes on to say all the thou shalt nots or you shall. So the focus is on you working. Under grace, God works. That's why... In reference to the new covenant, God said, I will, I will, I will. And we can see this in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. And I'm going to read these because they're so good. Because <laughs> he's doing the work <laughs> or he's done the work. So Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. It says, For finding fault with them, he saith, 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So you rest in his I wills as he works in you, through you, and for you. Only Jesus' work is a finished work. And not only did Jesus sit down at the Father's right hand when he finished the work, he made us sit with him, which tells us this in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, it says, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So sitting down in the Bible is a picture of the believer resting in the finished and completed work of Jesus. He has finished all the work on the cross on my behalf, on your behalf, and is now seated at the right hand of God. So I just don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not encouraging us to be lazy or unproductive or impassive in regards to the Lord when you hear me say sitting or resting. That's not what it's about. God's grace does not make you lazy and unproductive. It's just the opposite. It makes you labor more abundantly for his glory. In other words, we do not labor to be blessed, but rather we have the power to labor because we already are blessed. Yes highly favored in the beloved our savior who was born of a virgin innocent was sent by god to die so that we would live because of the cross the price for sin has been paid the judgment executed the anger towards sin exhausted the veil torn and the way to intimacy with god opened his love for us is everlasting and totally unconditional it describes his love to us in Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So God loves us with an everlasting love. God wants you to open your heart to his goodness. His love for you is unconditional. It is unchanging. He wants that intimate relationship. You dependent on a love that you can trust. There may have been a time or times in your life where a, for a love of a person has failed you. I'm here to tell you God's love does not fail. It's far exceeding above human love. He doesn't love like we love. He loves abundantly above all we can ask or think. If you can think about the greatest love you've ever felt or experienced, times that by a million. His love truly casts out all fear. So as an heir of God, you have a rich inheritance. You are richly loved, richly blessed, richly favored. Our Savior who robed himself in flesh, who died on the cross, who conquered death, hell, and the grave, who rose into heaven, has richly blessed us. The Savior of the world looks at you with favor. God sees you as his masterpiece. His masterpiece walking the earth in this time, in this dispensation, to carry out his truths. We have to continually cultivate and stir up the gifts within us to speak to the situations that try to knock us off course, pointing everything to the cross, the truth of the Savior. And if you don't know what to say in that troubling time, just say, Jesus, Jesus. The power anyway is in the name and everything that was created knows the name of Jesus. 
It will bow down to his name. Whatever the negative circumstance, it must bow down and obey the name of Jesus. But you have to believe in the one who died and gave you the privilege to know and speak his name in authority. Knowing this truth will bring the rest. It will cause you to sit down with him, trusting him. Sit down with him at the Father's right hand. Only the finished work of Jesus can bring wholeness, completeness, and the shalom peace. The law was fulfilled on our behalf. And the price for our sins has been paid on the cross. Our part today is to believe in our Savior and receive from Him the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. The Christian life is a life of rest in Christ Jesus and His finished work. It is time we rest from our efforts and to enjoy Jesus. The more we let go, trust in Jesus, and rest in Him, the more we'll find that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He will strengthen you and work mightily in you to give you good success. So as we go about the next few days, gathering with family and friends to recognize and celebrate the birth of Christ, let's remember the babe that was born so long ago, whom wise men followed a star to find him wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger, the Savior of the world, the one and only begotten Son, was birth for you and me. God had the perfect plan from the beginning of time he knew. He knew Adam would fall, and he knew Jesus would save the world. And he had us in his mind the whole time. That's how much he loves us. He died so that we would live. There is no better love than the love of our Savior. And my prayer for all of us is that we come into an understanding of this love He has for us and that we will reign in life through Him. Amen. Thank you, God. So I just want to wish everybody, you and your families, a Merry Christmas. And as you go and celebrate, just keep in mind we have a Savior who thinks you're blessed, knows you're highly favored, and he's in love with you. So anyway, God bless. Yes, Jesus.